Hello class. Welcome to Counting on Grace, Lesson 11. That's right, we're reading Counting on Grace by Elizabeth Winthrop. Today we are going to read three chapters, chapters 19, 20, and 21. I may need to stop and take a drink at some point. We shall see. Chapter 19, Up the Hill. Next picture, he herds us all together, boys and girls. He stands me in the front. I can't really see the eye of Mr. Graflex when it opens and closes, because the sun is so low in the sky it's making me squint. We can't stay no longer, I tell him. Chores to do. Not to mention that my feet are hurting bad, and my mare is going to chop my head off. He nods, still scribbling, and everybody bolts, some up the hill to Mr. Dupree's and beyond to their houses. When he looks up from the notebook, it's just him and me and Arthur. We help him pack. I take the spindly dog legs that don't weigh much. Arthur staggers around when he first tries to lift the leather pouch. It's holding all those black squares Mr. Hines slides in and out at the back of the camera. I can't afford to have you drop those glass plates, he warns Arthur. That's two days of work right there. I've got them, says Arthur. I can see the strap digging into his shoulder, but he don't complain. Mr. Hine walks right close behind him on our way up the hill, just in case Arthur should slip. Are you the reader Miss Leslie told me about? We both are, Arthur says, and that surprises me. He's the best. I'm the second best, I say. But he can write better than me. You did just fine this morning in my notebook. Mm, I'm slow. Her right hand don't work as good as her left, Arthur explains. I don't need him telling people my business, but for once I let him be. When did you see Miss Leslie? I ask. Oh, I went by the school. She thinks you kids shouldn't be in the mill. She's right, says Arthur. You have to keep quiet about all that at our house, I warn Mr. Hine, or you can't board over. You promise? I promise. Your parents want you working then. Of course. We need to eat and pay the rent and the store bill, I say. I mean to sound like my mare, and I do. You did come cause of the letter, didn't you? Arthur asks. Did you write it? He looks shifty. I wrote the words down, and I expect Miss Leslie told you what to say. We both helped her, I tell him. Arthur's leaning into the hill with that heavy pouch slung across his back. I'm getting out of the mill fast as I can, he pants. How are you going to do that? I've got plans. We've got some of our own, too, young man. You wait for us to take care of it. Your committee? I ask. That's right. Grace says you won't bother with a bunch of mill kids in this little town, Arthur tells him. Well, I came here, didn't I? You can't shut the mill down, I cry. Where would we go without jobs? We're not shutting down the mills. My pictures are going to show people out there what your lives are like. Then you won't have to work such long hours, and you'll get to stay in school at least till you're 14. I don't bother arguing with him about my age. I've got big feet, but my arms are scrawny. No matter how many birth papers my mare pulls out of the trunk, I know I don't look 14. We've already got laws, Arthur says. Nobody pays them no mind. Besides, you can buy fake papers that say you're old enough. Is that what you two did? My mother got some, I say quickly. Everything we tell Mr. Hine is sure to end up in his little notebook. I don't want him to write notes about my dead sister. That's private. French Johnny didn't even bother asking for my papers, Arthur tells him. After my father died, I had to work or we couldn't stay in mill housing. French Johnny says he was doing us a favor. Arthur spits out this last idea like it was giving him a bad taste in his mouth. Mr. Hines stops in the road and takes out his notebook. How many of the kids can read? He asks. Arthur wiggles the strap over his head and lowers the leather pouch to the ground. He looks glad to be putting it down. Me and Grace. Her brother Henry's starting. Norma can't. Rose can't, I say, going around the old classroom in my head. Thomas pretends. My older sister Delia can write her name and read a little of the prayer book at Mass. Dougie can't. Julian don't even speak English. Neither do Hubert or Lucien. They didn't go to the school at all. We go on listing the names while Mr. Hines scribbles away. Finally, he says, I'd like to take a picture of the two of you. 
He takes it right then and there, with me and Arthur standing side by side in the grass. Mr. Graflex don't scare me no more. When his eye starts moving toward us, I just glare right back at him, like the two of us are fixin' to fight. Arthur stands easy this time, shoulder to shoulder with me, his hands on his hips. I can't see him, but I know he's got that so-what-do-you-want look on his face. You and your committee better hurry up, Arthur tells Mr. Hine when he's saying goodbye. I'm not waiting much longer. Well, I'm doing what I can. Mr. Hine sticks out his right hand. Arthur stares at it for a moment as if he don't know what it's there for. Then he wipes the grease off his own best as he can and shakes. Chapter 20. Dinner. When Mamer sees Mr. Hine standing behind me on the doorstep, she shuts her mouth against what she was going to say. Henry yanks open the screen door. Hello, young man, says Mr. Hine. Good to see you again. Bonjour, bonjour. Hines got that hand out of his again, this time pointed at Papa, who puts his pipe back in his mouth so he can shake it. Thank you for letting me board with you tonight, Mr. Hines says. I understand from Grace that I'm to pay first. He pulls a silver dollar out of a mess of stuff in his pocket and lays it on the kitchen table. For a minute we all stare at it as if it's a live thing before Papa snatches it up with a nod and tucks it away in his shirt pocket. We're not fancy, Mamere says. She points over at Pepe's corner. That's your bed. We'll eat presently. You can wash your hands outside at the pump. I'll show him, I say. No, says my mother. Delia's going down to the basement with the first load of laundry. She can show him on the way. Grace, I need you to do some work for a change. Grace was working pretty hard in the mill this morning, Mr. Hines says, and I cringe. Be quiet, I mouth in his direction, but he's already following Delia out the door. I set his dog legs down in the corner by the bed and pick up the first potato that needs peeling. Where have you been? My mare asks. Showing Mr. Hine the way up here to French Hill? You've been gone longer than that. Did you walk him all the way to Massachusetts and back? He needed to take some more pictures. Good thing he's scrawny. Maybe he won't eat much. The screen door opens again and I feel my mare stiffen beside me. I hope Mr. Hine don't say nothing more to set her off. She can be touchy at the end of a long day like this, especially when our Hank clock numbers are way down. She'll take it out on me, but it was much his fault as mine. Suddenly he pulls up next to me and starts in peeling a potato. i never seen a man do that before, except for Pepe. No cause for that, Mimer says across the top of my head. We're all three standing in a row. You'll get your supper. Oh, my mother and father owned a little restaurant back home. This comes to me naturally. Where's back home? Delia asks from where she's laying the table. Usually she don't talk to strangers the way I do, but he must have made friends with her at the pump. He makes friendly quickly. He makes friends quickly. Oshkosh, Wisconsin, barks Henry as if it's the answer to a test question. Good memory, son. How do you know that? I ask Henry. Suddenly Mr. Hine ain't mine no more. It feels like everybody owns a piece of him. Miss Leslie made him give us a talk about his life. And then we looked at his camera, and he took a picture of us. So you know Miss Leslie? My mare asks later when we're sitting around the table. I suck in my breath and hold it. Let's not start talking about her. Uh, no ma'am. I only just met her this afternoon. She seems a good teacher. Notre Señor, says Papa. We bow our heads for the blessing, and I thank God for the food, and pray that my will forget about Miss Leslie for once. She don't. That Mademoiselle, that Mademoiselle Leslie may know how to teach, but she wants to keep our children from working in the mill. It's not for her to decide. Dear God, I pray again, please keep Mr. Hine quiet. Then I stare across the table at him with my eyes very big as a warning. He's not looking at me when he opens his mouth to say something, but Papa speaks first. What is your job, Mr. Hine? Why are you taking all these pictures? This time I try poking my foot across the table to knock him in the knee, but I hit the wrong person. Grace, what are you doing? Delia cries. She pushes my bare foot away, then wipes her hand off on her napkin. More grease on her smock. I take pictures of machines, and the people who work with them. And the school? Mimer asks, her voice sharp. And the school. The mill owners pay to run it, so they want to be sure Miss Leslie is giving them their money's worth. I start breathing again. 
I don't know if he's telling the truth or making up a pile of lies, but I can see Mamere smiling a little. Maybe it's because of what he's saying about Miss Leslie. More likely it's because Mr. Hind don't ask for seconds, even though his one small helping of stew was mostly potatoes. And the dollar I got him to pay is already safely stowed away in Papa's shirt pocket. After dinner, it's my turn at the washing. Hang the clothes inside, Grace, my mother says. It smells like rain to me. Could I go down with Grace to the basement, Mr. Hines says. Now why would he want to do that? He answers the question nobody asked out loud. I need the use of a sink and some water to develop my glass negatives. We're all standing there, hands in midair. This man is speaking English, but not words any of us know. What does that mean? I finally ask. He makes the camera draw the pictures on pieces of glass, Henry says. Well, how can that be? asks my father. Uh, Henry's almost right. I actually use a chemical solution to make the pictures show themselves on the surface of the glass. No fire, my mother says. No, ma'am. No fire this time. Well, Grace has a pile of washing to do, my father says. Oh, I can help her, Mr. Hines says, so the sink, so the sink gets freed up faster. Imagine a grown man doing the laundry. Mr. Hine is complimento, complimento, who, my mother is thinking. And she may be right, but I don't care. Anybody who wants to help me with the washing is welcome to join me in the basement. Again, I apologize for my horrible mispronunciation, or horrible pronunciation of French. Chapter 21, The Ghost Girl. He's a good scrubber, but he gets mad when the grease don't come out. I have to move him along or else we'll spend all night in the basement fussing over the hem of a mare's skirt. You a smoker? I ask. No. Your fingers are colored dark like my Pepe's. He said it was from the cigarettes he used to smoke. Ah, it's the developing chemicals, he says. Now he's scrubbing away at his fingers. They're like the dress. They don't come clean either. Does your Pepe live with you? He did, but he left, I say. You're sleeping in his bed. Where did he go? My throat feels like it's closing up. Uh, back to Canada. He don't like me working in the mill either. He wants me to go with him. Will you? I shake my head. I don't want to talk about Pepe no more. Are you married? I ask. Yes. What's your wife's name? Sarah Ann. She's angry with me at the moment. Why? Because I'm always on the road taking my pictures. Sometimes she travels with me, but not this time. She wants me home. Do you have children? Not yet, but I used to be a teacher. I figured that, I say, the way you act with kids. Why? You're not scared of a bunch of us all together, and you're not mean to us. Seems you're used to kids. Hmm, maybe I even like them, he says. Miss Leslie wants me to take the rest, make wants me to take the test for the normal school so as I can learn how to be a teacher. I trained at a normal school myself. Miss Leslie is right. You should do it, Grace. I roll my eyes. I'm a doffer, and one day I'll be a spinner, I say. That's my life. But even as I'm saying it, I know some little corner of me is hoping it's not true. Leave it be, I say, snatching Mamere's green skirt away from him. The grease never comes out completely. Even if it did, it'll just be back tomorrow. Let me try one more time. No, I say firmly, as I feed it through the ringer. I'm not going to waste no more time on a smock that's going to spend next week mopping up the mill floor. What I don't say is that my feet are swollen so big from standing that it feels as if the blood might burst through the skin, and I have to stand on them all day tomorrow and the next day and the one after that. But I'm not ready to leave. I want to see what he does with those pieces of glass he's been hauling around. So finally, when the clothes are hanging on the line above our heads, we carry in three full buckets of water from the pump. Then he shuts the door against the last bit of light and turns up the kerosene lantern he's hung from the clothing line. It glows red. His face takes on the color, and mine must, too. What's that for? Well, that's called a safe light. It lets us see what we're doing, but it keeps the picture safe so it doesn't develop too quickly. You remember the way I store my negatives in their holders? That's so the light doesn't hit them. Bright light will make the images come too fast. It sounds as if he's delivering babies. Rose's baby brother come too early and he died. The pictures can die too? Mr. Hines' face looks gloomy. 
Pictures die for lots of reasons, he says. If the subject doesn't stand absolutely still, then the image comes out blurry. Or if the flash powder doesn't light, then the picture's too dark and you can't see anything. Or if I drop the glass plate, then there's no picture at all. No wonder he stuck so close when Arthur was walking up that hill carrying his precious pouch. He sets up four tin trays in a row. He leaves the first one empty, pours half a bucket of water into the middle one, and powder from a little bottle into the third one. He makes me put water in there, too. Shake it back and forth a little, he tells me. Good. Now we're just about ready. How does it work? First, one is the developer. Second, the rinse. Third, the fixer. That stops the developing right where you want it. And the last one is another rinse. One by one, he pulls the glass plates and their wooden holders from the pouch and leans them up against the wall. They look like a line of kids waiting to be picked for a prize. How much do you, how do you know which one's me? The notebook, he says, sliding it out of his pocket and leafing through the pages. I keep a record of each picture as I take it. Here you are, number 14. I lift it so as to carry it over to where the trays are lined up. Careful, he says. I am watching every step I take. Even though it don't make no sense to me, he says this piece of glass has got me trapped inside it. I certainly don't intend to drop myself. With my hands tight on the wooden frame, he pulls out that dark metal piece the way he did just before he squeezed the bulb that set off the flash and started all the commotion. Then he flips down the edge of the holder so he can slide the piece of glass free. The surface is coated when I buy it, he says as he lowers me carefully into the first empty tray. You must be careful never to touch it because finger marks will show up in the final print. He pours a little bit of liquid from a vial onto the sheet of glass and then rolls that puddle back and forth until it drifts off all the edges. Watch, he says, whispering now. Suddenly, like magic, the glass is changing. Dark spots come up a little bit at a time and then faster. It's hard to see what they are, be what they are because the tray underneath is black and the red lantern makes so little light in the room. All the dark places you see here will be white in the final picture. That's why it's called a negative. The final paper print, the positive, is the photograph, he tells me, his voice as low as a prayer. It's as if he don't dare talk too loud or the magic spots will disappear on him. But I don't see why he's so worried. Those spots don't look like me or anybody else that I can make out. I put my nose closer. The nasty smell makes me pull away as he lifts the plate from that tray and slides it into the rinse. If I am there, I'm drowning under all the water he's swishing back and forth. Follow me he says, walking to the corner. He holds up the glass piece right in front of the white sheet we just washed. The water drips off onto my bare feet. There you are. I can't make my brain understand what I'm seeing. A black-skinned girl with white hair is staring out at me from her dark, deep, dark eye holes. It looks like that developing of his conjured up a ghost. We're both silent, studying on the person trapped in the glass who's looking right at me. She is holding still the way he told me to do, leaning back leaning back against a frame. I know it's hard to tell from the negative, he says, his voice quiet. I'll send you a copy of the print once I get home. Look closely now. That's your smock with the fat pockets and your arm leaning up against your machine. What do you call her? Marie. But what's wrong with my face? Nothing. You're very pretty. That's the same face you see in the mirror every morning. We don't got a mirror. Delia is always trying to catch sight of her reflection in the store window when we go past on the way to the mill. Whatever for, I wonder. Everything you're seeing is in reverse, he says. So your legs are white, and in this picture they're black. I finally begin to get it. And my feet are black from the grease, so that's why they're white in the glass here. Exactly. I reach out my finger. Don't touch, he warns. He's right. It is me. You know how I can tell? Marie's got two spindles that are missing their guides, and there they are, just below where I'm resting my elbow. Nobody else doffs Marie, so it has to be me. And now I'm looking closer, I can make out Delia's old shirt with the little white flowers that got passed down to me, and the little, and the little checks in my gingham sock smock. I'm teaching my brain to take everything it's seeing black and turn it around. But there's such a scared look in this ghost girl's face. How could she be me? I slap him on the arm and he flinches. That's not me, I say. Your notebook is wrong. That's some worried little woman. 
That's you, Grace, he says, and lets out his breath as if he's been holding it. We stare some more. I've got big eyes, I say at last. You see that cut? He glances at my right hand and then back at the picture. Sure enough, old Mr. Graflex caught it too. See what I mean about the grease? I tell him. You can't never get it out. You don't have shoes. No use messing them up in the mill. I keep wanting to touch my glass self, but he won't let me. My arms look awfully skinny, but they're strong. I can even lift the roving creels for my mother. I'm sure you can. You've got to be strong, Grace, to survive in the mill. He looks at me with such a sad face that I feel like shaking him. Without another word, he takes the negative back over to the third tray, and I trail behind as if he's carrying a piece of me, and I can't let him out of my sight. He lowers me into the water mixed with the fixer and leaves me there. I lean over to stare, but I can't see nothing. The smell of that one makes me wrinkle my nose, but I don't pull away. I disappeared, I cry. I didn't like that ghost girl, but that's all there was of me. I jiggle the tray and some water sloshes out. Mr. Hine, come quick. He's not paying no mind. The picture died already. He looks up finally from his place by the wall. He's working his second piece of glass out from the other side of the holder. It's all right, Grace. The background is too dark for us to see anything when the negative is resting in the trays. In a few minutes, I'll take it out of there, rinse it again, and set it up in a drying rack. Meanwhile, I'll start on this one of you and Arthur. Mr. Graflex has got me trapped inside two more pieces of glass, I know. But suddenly, I don't care no more. I feel limp. My feet are aching something bad. Above my head, I hear the pounding of my father's boot on the floor. Grace, bien zici, he orders. It's time for the rosary, I tell Mr. Hine. Off you go, then, he says. Open the door quickly and be sure to close it tight behind you. It's dark out now, I say. He don't answer. I can feel him waiting for me to go so he can get on with his work. The mare holds herself the same way when her foot's itching to jog the rail. Goodbye, I say. Maybe I'll see you in the morning. Goodbye, Grace. Thanks for your help. Moment I shove that door to, I know he'll be pouring the liquid all over me again. Me and Arthur. All right. That is the end of the three chapters that we're reading today. Make sure that you answer the questions for our assignment today. Thank you very much.